Hello there, YouTube. This is Sibbles and Bits back at it again. Uh, today we're doing Sit Down Saturday, and we will be talking about all of the inkbound crafted bindings, and generally speaking, like where they're good, what their flaws are, when you want to take them, and then putting them into a bit of a, a rough tier list. We're not going to be able to go in depth into each of these bindings. If you'd like me to do that, be sure to leave that down in the comments below. Uh, because I'm trying to keep this video somewhere around 20 minutes and we have like somewhere around like 11 bindings and there's no way that I'm going to be able to talk about them in two minutes. So we're going to go way over the uh, mark there. So first off, I want to state that I was a bit reluctant to make this into a tier list because I don't believe in the concept of simple like one axis tier list like this. And Inkbound's a bit more complicated for you to be able to make a multi-axis tier list. Like maybe we could uh, do something like that, but um, my main problem is, is that when you post a tier list, it gives the impression that something is always like better than the next thing. And that can certainly work in things like fighting games, MOBAs, uh, stuff like that where you actively have the choice of how you're progressing and you're in an environment against other things. In Inkbound, you're going up against, well, technically random bosses you get to choose, but um, you're only given certain books to choose from, so you go up against certain bosses. Those books have different things going on. You're playing a different class. Even as early as the Sea of Ink, right? The Vestige that you're given there, the Augment that you're given there, the Run modifiers in play. Even as early as there, the game starts to get complicated. And so just telling you guys that, oh, every time you take X, just take X every time you see it, you're going to win the game. I don't think it's necessarily that simple. And... So I didn't really want to put it into a tier list, which gives the impression of X is always better than Y. Because the game's not that sterilized, and that's not always the case, depending on what your situation is. The only reason why this is still going into a tier list format is because at the end of each thing that I would talk about, I would say, like, maybe, you know, after image, positives, negatives, really good situations, and then I would tell you, Yes, this is something that I would uh, like say it, it's a very good vestige, it's highly pickable, something like that. And then it's basically in a tier list in that form anyways. It's just now we've lost the visual representation and I guess we might as well keep the visual representation because while I don't agree to the fact that highly pickable bindings should always be picked over another binding, it's still uh, like a good way to present that so that people can see it. And I'm hoping that when I explain these things, it makes more sense and you can determine for yourself, especially because, you know, with Tearless Always, there is a little bit of a bias involved. I try to keep it the least amount of bias that I possibly can, but at the end of the day, I mean, I'm going off of my experiences one thing to note is that I do not choose bindings according to their ascensions. Because when you're first starting book one and you're choosing these bindings, you don't have access to the ascensions. If they were to maybe randomly offer you an ascended binding, that would be something completely different. That would be a completely different tier list, right? First off, to start with my credentials, in case you guys don't know who I am from the channel. I am a playtester for Inkbound. I've put nearly 300 hours into the game at this point. On camera, I have like probably near a 90%, if not higher win rate. Uh, off camera, generally the same. And the metric that we're gonna be going by is when you're going through your first book, you have problems that you need to solve. Either it's due to your class, it's due to the villain that you have to fight at the end of the book, at the end of the two books, or it's the guardian that you have to fight at the end of the current book. You might be in a certain situation, depending on the vestiges that you've gained, stuff like that. And so you have problems that you need to solve. 
So we are going to rank these by how likely are they to solve problems in a majority of situations and what problems are they good at solving and what problems are they bad at solving. What are some ways that you can make this these bindings like a little bit better and we're going to rank them accordingly. Highly pickable of course are bindings that are going to solve problems for a majority of classes either just because they're efficient or because they have like uh, good augments that um, you can get early that either boost other vestiges or not vestiges other bindings or themselves and they're easy to invest into uh, it's good is just um, it does its job it may only be relevant for a certain portion of the game but even if it gets you through the early game it's great but it's not quite to the point to where every time it shows up I'm considering it I respect it is a tier that by all accounts like I think that it's a good skill I personally just won't pick it and so I have it here it, it should technically be somewhere around like it's good and between like it's technically between it's good and barely pickable barely pickable means that it's either super niche there's very few situations where I would want to pick it but it still does that niche very well so I'm willing to pick it and then reroll is if it showed up and there was only like this one binding I would use a little grip clip to reroll it I would pretty much never take this and I don't think that anybody should take it as opposed to I respect it where it's like I'm very unlikely to take this but I do respect that it is a good skill okay so we're gonna start off with after image here after image I would put in it's good um, after image is one cost six cooldown and it provides evasive to the target and primes one critical charge so a lot of people think that this is like one of the best things in the game because of the fact that it primes critical charges and crits are more damage uh, my last sit down Saturday was about how like priming critical charges isn't really like as good as I think people say it is like you still need critical chance if I have critical chance already in the build like um, maybe a counter assistance maybe a twin fang maybe um, cheese cards like any boiling muck is really good anything that can give like a little bit of percent crit or a scaling crit and then maybe even if I found a crit try or a crit font already this starts to look very good for crit the other thing that makes this good is the evasion so evasion is able to negate one direct target attack and that makes it pretty notable as far as defense because later on in the game you're gonna have direct attackers dealing like potentially anywhere between 10 to 30 damage to you depending on if they have stuff like rampager or they're getting buffed or they're just like heavy enemies like the ink blaster and they've got like platinum cannon so this ends up saving a lot of health its only deficit is the uh the cooldown luckily both of its green mods uh will reduce its cooldown and if you have them both in conjunction generally speaking uh the second green mod is reduce the cooldown of the highest cooldown that you currently have it's usually going to be after image unless you also have like cleave so it's pretty solid it's very notable if you're going into Argoloth because very often you'll have tentacles like way off at the side of the screen that are going to direct target you and so then being able to evade those is pretty good same thing happens in the runestone fight sometimes the hands respawn and if they have full health they hit for like 15 direct target I believe and so just being able to ignore that in a fight where you can generally ignore anything that's going on anyways is very potent cultivate I would put this in I respect it I recognize that it is a not a zero integer skill my opinion is that cultivate is only good in multiplayer or in situations where it breaks the game and I don't think that that makes a good skill cultivate is one cost I believe six cooldown 
and what it does is it places a interactable on the field that gives you one will when you grab it so it's functionally even but if you uh, put augments into it it gives you other benefits one of which being an extra will it can give you shielding it can give you CDR it can do you know like everything a growing build needs right uh, it does air quotes everything every turn that it sits on the field it also gains plus one will up to five turns so if you place it down turn one then wait till turn three then it's going to give you like three will which is more than you invested into it my only problem with the cultivate is the fact that i don't see how laying that will on most cases is going to result in more damage than if I would have just used a damage skill. Now, again, it's got very good support in its uh, augments. I could put those augments into another skill that would usually generate more damage than that. Point being is that if you have an abundance of will, generally what you're doing is just auto attacking things, right? You're using your one skill. So, does your class or your setup at this point, this early in the game, do well when it has, say, 10 will? If you're a weaver, you could use it to thread stuff and get set up. If you are magma miner, bonk is a very good skill. So you could just go ahead and keep bonking everything. Maybe you have an on hit effect already, like uh, Misery's Whip or Burning Fist. Stuff like that. Maybe you already have frostbite and you already have too much frostbite so you need to spend all that frostbite. Then I could see cultivate being pretty good. And uh, the purple augs are like honestly pretty good on this. The one that gives you a 20% chance to drop a, an extra flower on top of you is probably one of the most busted purple augs in the game. Because, I mean, at that point, I you could pick up that flower gain the benefits this turn or wait one turn and then pick it up and gain an extra will that turn the one thing that i do like about cultivate is that it's very good as like a safety button if you're in multiplayer and you just drop it in the center of the arena sometimes people will miscount their will and then they'll be able to pick it up and get out of danger so in that case it uh it's like a better shield wall in that case but even in when um I'm playing multiplayer and somebody drafts this like nine times out of 10, it just sits there in the middle of the arena until the end of the fight until someone just picks it up. And if you consider it in a boss sense, so if you drop it on turn one and let's say that you phase the boss in book one on like turn one or two, right? You're doing pretty good. So now this thing is worth three because it is turn three and you get an extra three will is that better than something that just could have phased the boss on turn one guaranteed and then probably is off cooldown so that you could have could phase it or like finish the fight a turn earlier i don't know um it's again it's very complicated and most of the times that i math it out it doesn't look good so i've just like stopped trying to take it that's me personally. But again, I recognize that it's a good investment as far as will economy. And in certain situations, I think that it's very good. Cleave, I'm going to put in it's good. Because uh, when it first came out, I was definitely pretty hype about Cleave. Um, used to meme a lot, always believe in Cleave. After a while, I've sort of like dropped down on it a bit. Cleave is a two will deals 200 damage in a cone and has an eight turn cooldown and applies five bleed and five bleed is basically 50 damage every turn that never degrades so by the time that you use cleave you collect all your orbs and you use cleave again this has done 400 damage which seems considerable but as soon as you leave the early game cleave just stops doing stuff besides killing trash mobs or too well. Now, at the early game though, you might have a problem with single target and you're not going to kill them in one turn anyways. So being able to chunk them for like 200 and then deal 
50 every turn adds up. And so you might be able to take on uh, hard fights that you normally wouldn't. You might be able to phase, like say, Rinferno an extra turn. And this is pretty good for you because it's going to get you past book one. And then when you get into book two, like maybe it does something. Chemo allows you to pop your bleed early, but the problem is, is that enemy health scales much faster than bleed does. And bleed doesn't have anywhere near the same interactions as like say frostbite, burn, any of that stuff. Because you can't really scale it besides with physical damage and ability power. And guess what? Ability power scales all those other ones too. And so it actually just ends up not actually doing a lot of damage because of the fact that it has too long of a cooldown. If it had a lower cooldown, and this would be a way where you could make it like really work for you, is by figuring out ways to reduce its cooldown with like Harmonizing Whistle, with uh, Thanalope's Tuft, stuff like that. I believe its CDR is on common for some reason. And so you got to use a common on a skill that you're trying to spam now. So then you can't take as many plus bleed stacks. I don't know. Like it's a little weird. And it's purples honestly in my opinion are pretty garbage. Like plus 50 damage when other skills are like doubling its damage. Is not a lot unless you have the triple swipe ascension. Which again I don't draft according to ascensions like if i got that ascension maybe then i would consider that the other one is like heal one per enemy that you hit which is only good if you have the radius one that hits all around you or the triple hit because odds are you're only going to hit two maybe three things with this you might get lucky and hit four in which case that's great and all because you've just added an extra restoration onto your skill but you generally have this thing to deal damage. Same thing with like the shield on hit aug. It costs way too much for them to be trying to do that. And so I have it and it's good. Blink is highly pickable in my opinion. Blink is a one will, two cooldown movement skill basically. You're able to instantly blink um, anywhere around a character's like two to two and a half will range depending of course on how much movement speed you have, but that is a stat that isn't very good in the game. Another thing to consider too is that once you get to the top level, the game becomes what I call wiggle bound, where you're trying to utilize that uh, free zero cost movement as much as possible in the middle of all your bindings to try and like maneuver around and get a, get a line people up, get your ore, wiggle, get, use a skill, wiggle again, get out of the AoE. So it seems like, okay, well, if we're not using a lot of will to move, then this skill must be, like, relatively bad. And plus, we have uh, characters who have, like, movement skills anyways, like um, Magma Miner, right? No, Blink is good. Especially because it's technically, in a sense, saving, like, up to two will a turn. Like, that's great will economy. And if you consider that... Yeah, we're trying to get by as much as possible without moving around, but that also, like, constricts what we can do in our turn. When, with Blink, you can go ahead and, let's say, on Magma Miner, leap on a bunch of enemies for the heat, maybe bonk a couple people, uh, get rid of them, get some more heat. Then you can smash an enemy and then blink out of the danger zone when you normally wouldn't be able to do that you would have to figure out how to tank that, and you get to solve this problem for free. Its purple augs are pretty ridiculous. It gives you evasive, and it also spawns an orb. So as long as you're not uh, taking overstimulated or, uh, what is it, orb thief, then now you have an additional negative one cooldown to every skill, every turn, on top of an additional will. Like, it is an incredible skill. Jinx, I would put in Barely Pickable. Jinx is a two cost, I believe it's five cooldown, uh, like lob AoE skill that uh, deals 30 damage plus 30 damage for every dread that you have. And you generally gain dread by having enemies die. Uh, you can't usually carry dread between fights. So. A lot of people 
I want to say, underwhelmed by this skill. Because they look at it dealing, let's say, um, 150 damage on turn 1 up front. That's assuming that you kill a couple of things, and then you go ahead and you use the skill. And Cleave does 150 damage on turn 1 up front. And then, of course, Cleave has bleed. will never, like, match Cleave in damage. That's probably true in most cases. The thing is, is that Jinx is not competing directly with Cleave. Uh, being a ranged lob skill, it functions completely differently than uh, Cleave does. Notably, it is incredibly good at killing bats and, uh, what is it, spears, things that are trying to hit you from afar because its AoE is like just good enough to get two, maybe three things. And so you can go through most of your turn and then just lob this at the rest of the direct attackers that are going after you. And that negates all the damage for the turn, where you may not have access to that on th on classes like um, Clairvoyant, who would have to move the orb over there. Maybe Pulse is on cooldown. Um, Weaver would have to thread them first. Uh, Obelisk is way too slow. He's not going to get over there. And Magma Miner might even be boosting its damage with heat. And he has no range whatsoever, so he would have to leap over there and take care of those enemies. Whereas Cleave can only hit like directly in front of you, right? It attacks in a cone. And I think just because of that alone, that solidifies it in its own niche. Now, with the introduction of things like Smite in the game, um, sometimes it's in contest with another lob skill, which would be Incendiary, which can also do the same job. Uh, Cone of Frost can also do the same job with Augments. The other thing that um, Jinx does that those don't necessarily do is that it's able to burst damage through the first book pretty well. If you uh, need to kill something on like the last turn, like very often you're like stuck fighting a worm, it'll unburrow. You don't usually have enough damage to like kill it in one full rotation because all your stuff is on cooldown because you just cleared everything else. Usually Jinx will be able to just like nuke it, do quite a bit of damage and take care of the problem. Personally, every time that I've chosen Jinx, I've not been upset because... I don't take Jinx every time that I see it. I take it when I think that it's very good. And um, its purples are insane. Not the plus 100. That one's like okay. But plus 30 per Jinx. Uh, per Dread damage. Will definitely take care of you. Uh, otherwise this thing gets you through the early game. It kills lights. And you don't have to put anything into it. Honestly. It just does its job. Chain Lightning, I'm going to put in It's Good. Seems like a lot of people would put it in Highly Pickable. Chain Lightning is a one will, does like I believe 30 damage, but what it can do is it can jump to any nearby enemy up to a maximum range, but you can fix that by like aiming at the middle of a pack of enemies and then it'll make sure to spread across the screen. So it does pretty much 30 damage to the whole screen for one, which means that's, well, in the right situation. Which means that it's very comparable to Obelisk's uh, slam ability, Seismic Slam. It does half the damage, has half the cost, has about the same cooldown. So it's pretty fair to say that. What um, Chain Lightning also does is it applies shock to enemies. Which is, if an enemy has shock and takes damage, it will apply 50% of that dam damage to all enemies, including that enemy that has shock. So it's basically also incurring a one-time use 50% more damage multiplier, which is pretty good, especially when you have other multipliers. There's not a lot of multiplicative bins in this game, so having more multiplicative bins is good. And unless you somehow, I don't know, um, there are vestiges that do shock, but they're generally like higher like rarity vestiges you generally don't have them in book one so if you have good single target and terrible aoe like on magma miner is a good example then being able to shock everything maybe hit something with smash spread that damage 
to all the enemies on the screen, this provides you with very good AoE. And it provides you with very good uh, single target if you just have to, like, shock them and then uh, hit them with a skill that does, like, enough damage to merit it. Because if you're just going ahead and you're shocking it and then you're going ahead and using Smash, like, yes, that um, technically has added 90 damage, 30 damage from Chain Lightning, 60 damage from uh, the Shock on Smash, uh, plus you've got some heat in there, so it's not exactly that. It's a little bit more, but that's independent of uh, ability power, if that makes sense. But um, other skills can do more than 90 damage with one will. So this really shines when there's like a lot of enemies on the screen that you're able to technically multiply that damage and spread it across everything for the same reason of Jinx, right? If I've got enemies on the other side of the field I don't necessarily want to deal with or I can't deal with because of my class, uh, Chain Lightning can solve that. And with as early as green, I believe, there is an AUG that is plus 10 damage per enemy hit. And it um, goes up in sequence, right? So it doesn't hit everybody for, like, say, plus 60 if you hit 6 units. It'll hit for, I believe, 30, 40, 50, 60, so on and so forth. And that's a great way to just eliminate a bunch of bats that have, uh, like, built up. The little bit enemies that like to circle and surround you. It's, uh, it'll take care of quite a lot of problems. And if something's still alive, again, you just deal some damage, usually that'll take care of it. And I think for that reason, it's a very good skill. But you do need to have the single target to back it up. Now, sometimes that single target is combining it with Cleave, because Cleave does great single target. It's got uh, crit options. It can become a damage dealer. Again, uh, you put a couple of those plus 10s on it, and it'll just absolutely decimate everything, especially if it crits. I think it's a very good skill. Incendiary, I would put it highly pickable. Incendiary just solves a lot of problems that uh, a lot of classes have in the early game. Incendiary is a one will, three cooldown skill that deals 50 damage and applies five stacks of burn. Burn deals 10 every turn and then reduces by one. So eventually it'll like fall off. But the thing is, is that it has such a low cooldown that you're going to be able to stack burn. Like, that's not an issue. As soon as you're able to put this on a boss, it's pretty much on the boss. With a cooldown of 3, you get to use this every other turn. If you get the green aug that is negative 1 cooldown, now it's at 2. So now you can use it every turn if you use it before you take the orb. It also has uh, incredible purples. It can... Double uh, burn damage. I believe it's plus 10 burn damage. Maybe it's plus 20. If it's plus 20, that's crazy. But even at plus 10, that's ludicrous. And that's global, so it affects your entire character if you've got burn in other places. And then it also can get plus 25% damage versus enemies that are burning. That is a global multiplier for you, so long as the enemy has one stack of burn on it. Not net Again, it's global, doesn't even matter if it's from incendiary. In case you don't know, the plus X percent damage is exactly like Hex and uh, Shatter, where it is a multiplier. It's uh, multiplicative with power and crit, and it's additive with enemy damage resistance, except for on villains and bosses. If they have a mechanic that gives them damage resistance, that is its own bin. So if you're going up against, say, those worms in Promenade and you have access to, you know, plus 25% uh, damage versus enemies that are burning, you also have, like, say, Shatter on hit, and you go ahead and you toss this on the worms that are burrowed, they have 50% damage resistance when they're burrowed. You're reducing their damage resistance by 55%. You're now dealing full damage versus that worm just because you hit it with incendiary. That also applies to burn, <laughs> right? All incoming damage that they take from you is going to be increased. It is insane. And it's low cooldown. It's a lob AoE. It only costs one will. It does decent damage. It does 50 in an AoE. This can clear bats for you. And while I say I don't take 
what am I trying to say? I don't take these skills for their ascensions. All of the ascensions just help you a single target even more. Otherwise, like, this is very good early game single target damage, which a lot of characters have difficulty with, is phasing the, the mini bosses as soon as possible, the guardians, and this will take care of that for you easily. And that's not even counting all the interactions that Burn has in the game. Burn has the most interactions, the most scaling vestiges. You can have uh, stuff happen when you hit enemies that are burning. It's... I, I don't know. Like, it's it's pretty ridiculous, in my opinion. Um, restoration, I'll put it in... Res I respect it. I want to put it in barely respectable. The only place where I respect this... Actually, yeah, we're going to put it down in barely pickable. Because the only place where I think that this is good is in multiplayer. Because in multiplayer, there's often times where everybody clears the screen and somebody has a spare will. So you can use that spare will to heal somebody. This also does do other things. It can give some shielding. It can uh, heal some more. I believe it can reduce cooldowns on the enemy. It uh, can give resistant, or not on the enemy, on the ally. It can give resistant. And it can be free, reduce cooldown. Like, it's technically a good skill. It's just that I don't have time to use this in single player. And every time that I talk about the fact that I don't like restoration, it's it, everybody brings up the same thing, right? Same thing with Cultivate. Well, if you get this set up, you win the game. Uh, and usually it involves an ascension or like three different uh, vestiges. At the beginning of book one, I don't have time to be healing myself, thinking that in, at the end of the game, I'm going to get a specific ascension or I'm going to get a, like an OP set of uh, like vestiges that's going to carry me. And so I really, I don't think I ever picked this personally. I would on honestly, like, yeah, I'm going to put it down and re-roll even. Like, I've convinced myself. Like, there's, in, in a single-player setting, I don't think there's any reason why I would ever pick this up. In multiplayer, I would probably put it at barely pickable. I would still rather have somebody actually dealing damage, because that would prevent damage from occurring in the first place. In multiplayer, enemies deal more damage, so this plus four healing every two turns yeah I really don't personally respect it at all uh, invigorate I will put it at barely pickable invigorate is a one will I believe it's six cooldown and what it does is it gives you ten ability power for your next skill I would say that it's very good, again, in a situation where you have any button that you want to use and um, deal a lot of damage with it. If you're in a crit build, it's pretty good because it's another multiplier that you don't you generally don't have ability power at the start of the game. Um, it's very good for Super Spirit Bomb if you can fit that into your will economy because generally speaking... Um, I would say your opening turn is pulse or pulse and then you're like positioning it around and then the next turn you might be able to pulse, invigorate, and then go ahead and spirit bomb and that might clear the screen. Like that's good uh, because clairvoyant otherwise doesn't have any options. Their option is to pick up another orb and then pulse again. And that may or may not solve the problem. And uh, obviously you would want to have Spirit Bomb deal more damage. So it's good in that situation. It's good when you have a lot of damage in a particular point on Weaver. Because you can go ahead and set everything up like the perfect sew or the perfect constrict. I mean, like it just does damage that you can't normally do. Because otherwise it's going to be put on cooldown. The skill is uh, constrict will be on cooldown, so will be on cooldown or stitch, I believe it's called. And you're gonna have to wait till next turn when you pick up your orb and wait for cooldowns to occur to be able to do it again. So this allows you to deal that damage up front for the cost of threading something, which is very good will economy. Um, I 
honestly think that's about it. Like, otherwise, uh, combined with other things, like, uh, Invigorate Jinx, for whatever reason you need, like, a big explosion or something like that. Um, the fact that it's next skill really gets in the way of a lot of things. A lot of the problems of this are somewhat fixed when it gets ascended, but, again, I'm not picking it now to ascend it. It does get good things. It gets CDR, it gets cost reduction, uh, so eventually it will start paying for itself. It's just that, again, the amount of builds that uh, would want to see this, as opposed to, like, say, Incendiary or even After Image. Maybe you have After Image, and again, you're trying to crit and get more damage. That's great. Um, the amount of builds that want this over other things, when you're offered three things is very low but i do think that it's definitely pickable it's just very weird the one class that would want it the most technically magma miner not only do they produce um ability power on their own already so that dilutes this but it also if you use this after you have heat it doesn't deal damage so then you lose all your heat but it still gives you as much as 10 heat. Like it's, I don't know. So if for whatever reason you just wanted to smash something, you could uh, go into this, then smash, and it deals damage. So if you have um, the orb on kill early, I could possibly see that. Or you have the shock into smash setup. I could see shock and invigorate being a thing. Basically invigorate really needs other things in order for it to be pickable. Pilfer, I'll put it in I respect it. I think that depending on how good you are at the game, this is possibly up at highly pickable. The reason being, uh, Pilfer is a one will, I believe five cooldown skill that just steals money. It steals somewhere around I believe they said it's like 20 to 30 quillings each time you use it. And it can give, um, with augs, it can drop orbs, which definitely pays for itself. But otherwise, it's in one of those greed is good situations, right? It's like cultivate, except instead of actually preparing yourself to deal damage, you're literally just using a will to steal money that does nothing for your current fight. Now, money is very good in uh, Inkbound because it allows you to buy your build at the end of the game. If you get to the Chapter 3 Elites, you can go ahead and keep spamming the reroll on the box there, and it will um, eventually hit Legendaries if you're looking for that, or if you're looking for a specific purple, you can go ahead and get that. The inclusion of Miser's Purse and Mumsy's Money Machine means that you can use uh, Quillings as a scalable damage source you can go ahead buy all the heals you want yeah like i said if you're good at the game and you can get away with uh like hemorrhaging one will like every two turns you're pretty much going to be able to like buy your line and win um you won't be able to buy the build that you want per se like you probably won't get like exactly the same build like everything that you need but you're going to get enough to win like you get a couple legendaries in this game you've pretty much won the game so, if anything, you get to the final shop with, like, 900, you buy whatever legendaries in the shop, re-roll, buy whatever legendaries in the shop, you've probably won the game. Poison Vapor, I'm going to put down in It's Good. I just don't think that Poison is in such a good spot right now. Otherwise, like, it does great damage. Um, let me go ahead and get my, uh, my calculator over here. So it is a one will, I believe it's a four cooldown, it deals 10 damage, like it deals enough damage to like, you know, apply on hit effects. Uh, it's pretty good at removing phasing for that reason, but it also has a damage component so it can grab crits off of like say after image and other prime crits, so that's a little annoying. Uh, hits in a large AOE around you, applies 30 poison, Poison is 5 magical damage per stack, and then halves thereafter. So, by the time that you're able to use this skill again, assuming that you don't have any other sources of poison or anything like that, 
It's dealing 260 damage, like, every two turns. It's pretty good. The only problem is, is that if it doesn't kill things in the first turn, where it's dealing, like, 150 damage, then it drops off by half, deals 75 base damage. Uh, you really need to make sure that it's killing things on the first application, and you may not have access to that right away. If you can get to that point... Absolutely. I think that it's incredibly highly pickable, but that would pretty much imply that you got, uh, like, I don't know, a high rarity, a couple high rarity plus poisons. Maybe you got Beat of Ivy, and um, then this came up on, like, your pick before the boss. Absolutely. At that point, obviously, it's highly pickable, but otherwise, it, like, does damage. I don't respect it anywhere near as much as Incendiary, simply because incendiary very easily clears it in damage uh but the fact that it hits everything is kind of nice uh but incendiary will usually just kill the bats too so then you don't have to tank the bats it's sort of just the weird spot where poison is because i think of how i think it's because of how op it was in the pre-alpha that it just got like a little over nerfed it also, of course, doesn't have anywhere near the amount of uh, Vestige support as uh, Fire does. But it stays on enemies for quite a while. And it also has access to the same types of purples that uh, Incendiary does. Where it gets the plus 25% multiplier. Or it just doubles burn damage. Actually, I think, it, I think that one's a plus 10. Which would mean that it more than doubles burn damage. I don't know. <laughs> I usually just take the multiplier because um, it's just worth more because you can make poison do like double its damage, which is great, but or you can make all your skills do more damage against things that are poisoned, which usually adds up to more, in my opinion. Um, Cone of Frost, I'm going to put in Barely Pickable. Cone of Frost is a one will. I uh, believe it's... Five cooldown? It might be four. I think it's four. Every two turns, you're able to do it with uh, with orbs anyways. And it deals, I believe, just 20 damage. Again, kind of like um, Cone of Frost. It has a damage component, which does stuff. Uh, and it can also take crits, which is a little annoying. But uh, it will leave five Frostbite. No, four Frostbite. And Frostbite is every time that you deal damage to an opponent with a hit uh, specifically from your bindings it will deal 25 magic damage and get rid of that frostbite and so when they run out of frostbite you no longer get that bonus damage uh, frostbite is good enough right now it again was pretty OP busted in the pre-alpha because it was per damage per stack which was insanity because there's actually quite a lot of sources of frostbite in the game and that's kind of what's going against Cone of Frost here, is there's so many sources of adding Frostbite to things, and in single player, there's almost no way you're going to get past the amount of Frostbite that you're applying. And if you do, it's like one or two actions. So Frostbite by itself, like one source of Frostbite will generally have you covered. And then you have Frostbite the whole time. All of them also add Frostbite damage. And so you're in the situation where you will very often get to the point to where you have like 20 stacks of Frostbite on a heavy. And all it's doing is like 40 damage every time you hit it. And there's no like payout there unless you're literally Obelisk. Which is very weird because literally everything else has a burn this now option. Anyways... It's still a very good cone. If you get uh, extended range at green, it's a very large cone. It has a blue aug that adds 75 damage to it. At that point, it's more will efficient than cleave. You don't have the bleed, obviously, but you still have frostbite. Um, frostbite is very good for classes that generally have to spend will in order to set up. Like, say, clairvoyant having to move its orb around in order to get it into range or Weaver with Constrict on many enemies trying to get shielding off of its uh, augs. 
it um, since constrict will reduce its damage for the amount of people that you have constricted if you can get some cone of frost out there then constrict it will generally like kill bats and at that point it feels pretty good um, again when you're just threading things it'll deal some damage which is equal to threads damage uh, if you're hitting things with um, say even poison vapor right that'll uh, cause uh, frostbite to hit but it just does like just enough damage that it is there and it's good enough in the early game and in the late game when you get to purples like uh, the plus 25 frostbite damage aug is pretty good but uh, the plus 25 percent damage versus frostbite it's a little weird because near the end of the game you might have better will economy so now you actually are running out of frostbite where the other skills don't have this problem you could um, you could run out of frostbite and now you don't have that 25 percent multiplier anymore otherwise like I said some some classes miss kills by like just just enough and so having cone of frost to just help them finish those enemies is very helpful and it can become a very good damage skill if you put two blues into it uh, because 170 base damage in a large cone um, that trucks <laughs> like for one cost uh, every other turn like that thing will that thing will carry you so it might even be in your aug path that uh um, shield wall, the last one, is, uh, I have it at reroll. Now, it can give you resilient. That might actually be an ascension. I might have lied there. Um, it gives you two spike, which isn't enough. It's basically dealing 20 damage to anything that deals damage to you, which technically is action economy if you can tank it. But it only gives you four shield. Enemies in this game deal way much more than four damage. Even if you're a tank build, I don't think you want this. I think you would prefer to have, like, literally anything else. Even Cone of Frost would technically do more damage than this. If you have a ton of spikes damage, I still think that you would prefer to, like, just produce spikes elsewhere. And you definitely don't have that at the early game, too. Like, you might have Beat of... Uh, what is it? Beat of Metal? I still wouldn't take uh, the skill. Again, enemies deal way much more than 4 damage. If this could block an attack, I would respect it a little bit more. But after image just does its job at all stages of the game, and this just struggles to do anything. Like, it'll give you 4 shields, which is, like, as far as action economy, pretty good, because generally speaking, you don't make that much, especially in the early game, like Obelisk does. If you're Magma Miner, if you get up to 5 heat, you're going to make it. But, um... I, I don't know. Like, the, the numbers on this thing... If this is causing you to go positive in health, right? Like, it's, it's actually blocking damage and causing you not to take damage... What are the odds that literally any of these skills would have just killed the thing that's dealing damage to you? That's all I have to say about that. Otherwise, I believe it's on a four-turn cooldown. It's not bad. Like, it just needs... At one point in development, the game had its damage doubled. And our health was pretty much, like, almost double, I believe. And for whatever reason, all sources of shielding, which most were merited, by the way, uh, were reduced by half because it was just at a point to where you could just tank the game. But I think shield wall just kind of got left in the dust there and it doesn't do enough. I don't know. Anyways, that's where I have all of these ats. If you have any comments you want to make about, uh, you know, where I have things placed here, maybe I missed discussion on something that you feel needs to be added to the conversation. Maybe you disagree with something and you want to, again, like put your feedback into the conversation down below. By all means, go ahead. And um, 
I don't know, if some good points are made, I can pass it on to the dev team probably, and uh, we can maybe get some feedback put into the game. Anyways, hopefully it was educational or entertaining. And as always, if you have any feedback whatsoever, be it questions, comments, concerns, misplay alerts, uh, be sure to put that down in the comments below. And until next time, I'll catch you guys around.